And we're going to go to the book of Joel tonight. Book of Joel. We're going to, I'm going to do a series on the, the little books in the Bible. I don't often look at those. Joel is just three chapters. He was a prophet to Judah. We don't know much about him, really. Uh, his name means Jehovah is God. And he's evidently the first writing prophet. And what that means is he wrote before these other guys. Now, there was other prophets that didn't write. And I guess we could say Moses probably was the first one. But uh, you know, the day of the Lord is, is the theme that that expression comes up. Now, it's listed earlier in the Bible, but he, he wrote it earlier in time. Maybe a good way to remember the day of the Lord is as opposed to the day of man, or the day of Satan. And it's, it's really talking about when uh, the time of judgment comes at, at the end times there. It begins with the rapture, the great tribulation and that. We're going to look in uh, Joel chapter 1. I looked at a lot of resources on this, and uh, I think every author had a different outline for the book of Joel. <laughs> And some different meanings and things. So uh, I'm not, my strong suit is, is not prophecy, but uh, you, you've got to, you've got to believe it, number one, and we need to have some understanding about it. He, he starts off talking about his, God's judgment of Judah with a, a real physical judgment that happens. Uh, so let's, let's read Joel chapter one, st starting in verse one. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are as the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. <laughs> and he's talking there about the locust. That's the army that's, that's coming. In uh, verse 15, he says, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Now, he uses this as an illustration then as he goes on of the uh, prophecy of the coming day of the Lord. But this is an actual physical uh, problem that, that Judah faced. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any after it, even to the years of many generations. Now this um, infestation of locusts, locusts, plague of locusts, now this is the kind where Whenever something happened like it, the people would, would be able to say, oh, it's nothing like back when those locusts came in aught 12 or, you know, whatever it was. Uh, this, is, this is going to be the worst plague of locusts that, uh, that they, would have, they would have seen. Uh, they used to think uh, verse 4 was different kinds of bugs, but they've realized, and I think it's true, that it, it's just the different stages of a locust existence. If you've ever... We saw a plague of, I don't know if they were locusts or grasshoppers or what, but in Western Australia, and there's a time when they don't fly. They do a lot of damage then. They, they just crawl around. Then, then they start to fly. There's, there's several different stages that they go through. In, um, in Joel here, he, this is not, he's not spiritualizing something. He's talking about real locusts, and they're really eating everything. But it also has a symbol. He's also using it to symbolize the coming day of the Lord, a future event. It's interesting it, in verse 5, 
the drunkards are mainly concerned because they're not going to have grapes for their wine. <laughs> you know, it affects the drunkards. Uh, it affects the, the priests. Verses, verse 13, uh, gird yourselves and, and lament, ye priests. In uh, verse 17, it, it affects the very earth. The seed is rotten under their clods, and the garners are laid desolate. They're, they're going to eat not only the, the leaves, they're going to eat the, the roots of things. Uh, in verse 18 and 20, it affects the, the animals, the cattle. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yeah, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. Uh, verse 20, the beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of water are dried up. The fire hath, the fire hath devoured the pastures of of the wilderness. This was a, a, a terrible plague that was uh, coming upon uh, Judah. And, and it points to uh, the tribulation. Let, let, before I get to that, let me just read this. Um, we have a magazine that is a historical magazine. And uh, one of the articles I came across was a, a lady who was a child when they had a plague of grasshoppers in the 30s in the States. Um, she said they moved to a, a new farm, and her and her sister, they, they had two apple trees just outside their window. They loved those apple trees. She said, we'd lie across the bed and gaze at the trees, delicate pink and white blossoms. <laughs> she says, then one fateful day, a dark cloud moved toward our home, our farm. An ominous whirring sound emanated from the cloud's ever-changing shape as it settled on our field of grain. Millions of grasshoppers devoured our entire crop. We watched helplessly, listening to the enemy ravage our once promising field of wheat. They outnumbered us 10 million to one. The grasshoppers weren't satisfied with just destroying our fields. They descended on our beloved apple trees. My sister and I climbed the trees and tried to kill off the hoppers one by one. They escaped us easily. I grabbed a large wash tub from the porch and placed it under one tree. We then climbed the tree and tried to knock the grasshoppers into the tub so they'd drown. Our mother came out of the kitchen and said, you can't fight grasshoppers. There's nothing you can do. Um, she said, I know you want to help, but there's nothing you can do. Although I didn't want to give up, I knew mom was right. You can't fight grasshoppers. I watched as they ate all the leaves from our tree and then attacked the apples. Soon the tree was bare except for the apple cores, stripped to the, to the branches. I cried then, just as I do now, writing this nearly 60 years later. <laughs> it was my only experience of total defeat. Despite yet another complete crop loss, my parents accepted the situation and continued to trust in the goodness of God. <laughs> Isn't that interesting that she'd add that? Uh, you know, I've, I've never been through something like that, and, uh, but I guess it's just devastating. They just eat everything that can be eaten, even sometimes the bark on the trees. It's just an amazing thing. The thing we saw when, when they had it in WA was people would put uh, window screens in front of their car as they drove, and they'd just be thick with grasshoppers. They'd stop at the, along the road and get them off. And if you didn't do that, they'd cover your, your radiator, and pretty soon you'd, you'd boil over. But uh, you can imagine with Israel, uh, you know, there's no Social Security, and uh, there was no, nobody else to look to. Uh, so when those things were eaten, it was, it was tough times. And uh, it, was, uh, it was God's judgment on Judah. And that's what Joel was, was telling them. The, amazing, the thing I find amazing in, in Scripture is, you know, as tough as God is on us, you always find mercy. You, you read through the book of Joel, and it's just full of God's mercy. And uh, you know what a blessing it is. Uh, God uh, is calling to them uh, to, to repent. You know, that, that's the whole purpose of, of Joel's message. I look at chapter 2, uh, verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. When he's saying, rend your heart and not your garment, evidently they had a, like a custom that they would tear their clothes. They might not actually feel repentant, but they would act like they were repentant. <laughs> and God's saying, it's not enough just to act like, it's not enough to tear your clothes. He said, tear your heart. You need to have a, a broken heart over these things. Uh, verse 15, 
Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. This was not a joyous time, this was a time of, of repentance. Verse 18, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Aren't you glad that God has pity and, and mercy? Uh, verse 25, he says, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I send among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. My people shall never be ashamed. You know, God's judgment on, on Judah. He's calling them to repent and he's promising them uh, mercy. And what a blessing it is to, uh, to see that. And with the prophecy that comes, yeah, he, his call is the same. You know, when he talks about the end times, uh, that's a time when, when God uh, really uh, helps his people to turn back to, to him. And in this, this book is the, the promise of the Spirit, Joel chapter 2, uh, verse 28. Now, remember, this is dealing with Israel. You know, we get so used to being New Testament Christians, we just think everything about us, you know. Uh, but he's talking to Israel here, and he's talking about the, the day of the Lord, which is, is yet to come. And uh, so when he's talking about the Spirit here uh, in uh, Joel 2, uh, let me start reading verse 28. Uh, he, he's talking about uh, tribulation and, and those times. you familiar with in the uh, book of Revelation, it talks about the 144,000. Those are Jewish evangelists. And it's an amazing time for, for Israel during the, the tribulation as they turn to the Lord. And this, this has to do with that. Joel 2, verse 28 it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Uh, so he, he talks about the promise of the Spirit. And uh, during that uh, day of the Lord, during that time still to come, that during the tribulation, there's going to be a great turning of uh, Jews and Israel uh, to the Lord. Uh, this is... This is talking about the Holy Spirit's work in, in the day of the Lord, not in our, our church age. You know, Jesus had told the disciples, I shouldn't say had, Jesus tells his disciples after, in uh, the book of John chapter 14 that the Holy Spirit would uh, dwell with them and he would be in them. You know, that's the New Testament uh, experience that we have that God has, has done. It's, it's John 14, uh, 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Probably familiar with Acts 1, 8. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you're probably familiar as well that Peter quoted Joel when uh, in the... Uh, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, day of Pentecost, and uh, people were speaking in other languages, and some of the people were mocking and saying, oh, they're drunk. You know? <laughs> and uh, Peter quotes pretty much what I read there, uh, chapter 2, 28 to 32, and uh, he, he's telling them, you know, don't mock, you're Jews, you should understand this. This is what God has, has said is going to happen uh, in the last day. Now, he's not saying that Pentecost fulfilled that. Now, be careful with that. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, when, when he says, um, these are not drunken as you suppose. He says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he just basically lays it out, what, what Joel had said. Uh, but this, uh, the day of Pentecost was not a, a great, and it was not a terrible day. Uh, there was not earthquakes and darkness and blood and, all the things that he talks about, those, those are coming in the tribulation. Uh, the day of Pentecost was a wonderful day. It was the day when the Holy Spirit came for the New Testament age and the, the church age. So be, be careful with that one. But he talks about the Spirit in Joel so that he was 
Uh, Paul was then able to say, well, you should know about the Holy Spirit. You know, this is, this is what uh, Joel talked about. Uh, when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, uh, Paul, Peter, you, you know who I mean. Uh, Peter used the prophecy of Joel to describe the, the power of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the prophecy of Joel was not fulfilled then, uh, but it was a guarantee that God would ultimately fulfill all that uh, Joel had said in that day. Um, it's interesting, as Peter quotes it there in Acts chapter 2, you know, we think of that as, as just a, a New Testament concept. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, Romans and Acts and different places. Well, that comes from the book of Joel. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Joel 2, verse 32. Now, one of the authors I was reading today said that in the Hebrew Bible, uh, chapter 2, 28 to 32 is the, actually the third chapter. I didn't know the Hebrew Bible had chapters, but anyway. And he said that the third chapter in ours is the fourth chapter. But uh, he said it, it's that important of a, of a section that they've, uh, they've made it a, a chapter. So we see uh, God's judgment on Judah in, in the book of Joel. We see uh, his promise of the Spirit. In chapter 3, you see God's judgment on nations. I'm not going to get into Revelation and all the end times and everything tonight, but uh, in Joel chapter uh, 3, uh, for instance, verse 2, he says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel. Uh, later on, verse 9, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. <laughs> it's the opposite of what the world likes to quote, isn't it? There's another verse that says, beat your swords into plowshares and so on. Now, this is talking about it's, it's going to be time for war, you know. And it's, it's not much of a war when you're fighting the Lord. But uh, God's judgment on the nations. Uh, verse 16. Uh, quite a, quite a, we could read all of the verses, really. Uh, put in the sickle, he says in verse 13. Uh, 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Uh, verse uh, 15, the sun and moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw, withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people, the strength of the children of Israel. Uh, you see his judgment of the nations. But then you see at the end of the book the restoration of Judah. In, uh, let me read verses 18 to, uh, to 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk. And all the rivers of Judah shall flow with water. And the fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness. For the violence against the children of Judah because they've shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. And it's good to see what the, what the Lord has, has in store. You know, people think they can stand up against God. You get some who, like we talked about on Sunday, just ignore God. But there's others who just actively oppose Him. And they oppose God's people and so on. And it's just not going to work. Uh, there's, there's coming uh, in uh, Revelation, he talks about the judgment of the nations. And then uh, here he talks about the restoration of, of, it, of uh, Judah, Israel. There's a couple of verses in Zechariah I thought I'd mention. Uh, Zechariah 14, oh, verse 1, he says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Verse 2, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Zechariah 14, verse 2. Uh, verse 3, he says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Uh, it sounds just like, uh, well, it is. It's the same thing you read in Revelation. As God is going to have several battles. But his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. Uh, it's going to be a great day, the, the day of the Lord. Uh, we believe as, as Christians... Uh, we're not going to be in the wrath to come. Uh, God is going to take us out. 
Uh, it's often been likened to looking at the tops of two hills. You, you, you see the prophecies of Israel, they're the tops of the hills, and in that valley between is the church age. That's where we are. And uh, God is going to take us out, and we'll, we'll come back with him at the, at the second coming. But uh, the book of Amos, uh, book of J Joel, get the right book um, in my notes. The next one's Amos. But uh, the, the Lord Jesus shall reign in person. And it, it's going to be a, a blessing as God restores Israel. Um, um, they get saved and, and so on. Zechariah 14, verse 20 says, For Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Um, I meant to actually read from Zechariah. And that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. <laughs> you know, when Jesus rules, everything is going to be about the Lord. He, yeah. I guess we won't have cars, but horses. And uh, it, it'll all be about the Lord Jesus. That's going to be a, it's going to be a blessing. So, in the book of Joel, you, know, you can look at some of these books and you can think, oh man, what does all this mean? Well, at least you can get the basic simple message. God judges sin. God judges sin. God calls us to, to repentance. And uh, sin brings judgment. Repentance brings, brings blessing. You know, it's, it's pretty much that, that simple. There's some well-known verses in Joel. Uh, those about uh, the Holy Spirit. But as well, the one I read, uh, Joel 2.13, Rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. Also the one in uh, chapter 2, verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. Uh, you know, repentance brings blessing. Uh, God is going to help Israel. God has a plan for Israel. And the same is true for us as individuals. You know, if we'll repent, uh, God can help us. God can bless us. All right, any comments or questions? I do have a little thing about the life cycle of a locust, if anybody's interested afterwards. So.